We would like to welcome our implementation panel to the stage. Chris Height is a professional landscape architect who leads Dix Height Plus Partners, a Central Florida-based design firm she founded with fellow landscape architect Jeff Dix in 1996. Chris's design work celebrates the unique characteristics of a place's social and geographical context, with a special focus on local ecologies, cultural identity, history, native plants, local materials, urban form, regional character, and quality of life. Dr. Richard Levy is a senior advisor for Tavistock Development. Richard is a senior executive with extensive experience in land development, economic development, master planning, and real estate investment strategy. Dr. Patrick Bolin is Director of Landscape and Natural Resources and Arboretum and Professor of Biology at the University of Central Florida. The Landscape and Natural Resources Department is responsible for landscape operations and natural resource management on UCF's main campus, Lake Nona Medical Campus, and other UCF facilities. Dr. Bolin also oversees the UCF Arboretum, which provides opportunities for relevant, experience-based learning, urban ecology research, and human connection with ecosystems and landscapes. David Ressler is the outsourcing and curbside leader at Cherry Lake, an integrated environmental horticulture and landscape company in Central Florida. David is a certified arborist, Florida licensed irrigation contractor, and FNGLA certified landscape contractor. He is a graduate of the University of Florida, where he earned a bachelor's degree in horticulture and has a master's of business administrations from Rollins College. Welcome to the implementation panel. We're um, glad to see everybody and really appreciate that you're all here. Um, the panel today is talking about the why to the how um, and then showcasing some of the things that have been happening over the last year or so um, as we've been working to you know, change the paradigm around how we um, work with landscapes. Just a gentle reminder of, of you know, why outside. Um, basically, it's promoting the adoption of sustainable landscape practices in Florida broadly um, from the macro to the micro. Why is outside so important? You know, if we share information, if we collaborate in unusual ways, um, we can really work towards a more sustainable 2070 and beyond and really create a win-win. Uh, the thing that's super unusual about outside is you have developers collaborating, you have practitioners collaborating, um, there's a, uh, a wonderful uh, sense of true uh, collaboration uh, across disciplines from um, the idea to delivery. So again, a, a general reminder, um, the 2010 baseline is on the left of the slide. That's where we were 10 years ago. As we're looking ahead um, to 2070, the trend of development is on the right. Uh, this has some pretty major implications. And so if we can implement um, smart growth, conservation, and wise landscape management practices, you know, we might do some pretty amazing things. So 2070 trend, um, 2070 alternative on the right. It's uh, pretty telling. And you can really see um, how, again, if we, if we uh, implement sustainable practices, we're, we're going in the right direction. So I'd like to turn this over to Richard. He's going to give us the, uh, the nuts and bolts on the developer perspective. Thank you, Chris. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about a project that uh, I mentioned last year at Outside, and uh, it is now emerging, coming out of the ground. It's Sunbridge. It's a 24,000-acre project in uh, northeast Osceola County. Um, it's a master plan community and has all the, all the uses, uh, neighborhoods, commercial, employment uh, uses. And I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing to experiment with uh, sustainable landscape design to, in, a, in a small scale in an effort to per, perhaps move the needle and change the paradigm on the, on the large scale. You only had to look at Chris's 2070 map to know the volume of growth that's coming our way, and we can't sustain the, the existing 
um, uh, approaches to uh, development, and most importantly, um, uh, resource protection. Uh, from, a, from a developer standpoint, our approach to landscape, number one, you're in the development business to make money. Uh, that's not a bad thing. It's what makes uh, the business work. And so any landscape um, approach has to be financially sound. Um, we also work within a very strict regulatory framework. Water supply policy, water quality policy are going to be key limiting factors and, and a large, to a large part driving the industry to change the way in which water is utilized. And that's a big factor in why we approach landscape from a, from a different perspective. We also have a unique ecosystem in Northeast Osceola County. It's in the eastern side of Central Florida. Water tables at the high, uh, very close to the surface and, and only certain plants and only certain um, uh, landscape regimes will work in that particular environment. So we need to understand what sustainable landscapes will work in that, um, in that setting. And finally, um, we are in the business to make money and we have home buyers and we need to understand what those buyers want and need and we believe we have a sophisticated buyer. We're ta Tavistock Development, we've developed um, Lake Nona and uh, we've been very successful in understanding what our buyer, buyer's desires are and part of, part of our effort is marketing this project towards a more sustainable, um, uh, an understanding of what sustainable landscape means. So in order for us to make the shift towards a more sustainable landscape, we have to understand what works in, in our setting. And uh, what we're going to do is, this is a, a site plan of our, what we call base camp, which is our key marketing location in the project. And what will work in our ecosystem, we're gonna test in a small area you can see outlined in the red dashed line. We are gonna test different na native plants we're gonna test different uh, combinations of soil amendments and also irrigation regimes. Our hope is that this project, through working with our partners, uh, we will get an understanding of what works in, in, our, in, our, um, in our ecosystem. Um, and our partners are key to this. Cherry Lake, um, the supplier of material, the University of Florida Sustainable Floridians Program, the University of Central Florida, the Sunbridge Stewardship District, which is the independent special district that is the governance structure of the project, um, is, is a partner here as well as the company Life Soil. So these five partners have come together. You can see the area outlined in green to develop test plots for uh, testing different um, plantings under different uh, landscape uh, uh, irrigation and soil amendment regimes. This is part of a larger effort um, in Sunbridge, what we call the Eco Life Project. It is our key to our marketing strategy. Uh, again, appealing to the more sophisticated buyer, uh, caring for the land, water, and wildlife. Uh, we have five key pillars of, of our Eco Life Project, water quality preservation, water resource conservation, renewable energy and efficiency, ecological preservation, and community engagement. And it's these five pillars that are, are driving our, our whole approach to the uh, entire project and our, and our test project um, is, a, um, um, is a key component and a first step in that, in that regard. Um, our ultimate goal here is to develop a Sunbridge specific landscape code to replace the standard county uh, requirements for landscape material we wanna self-impose uh, a more sustainable um, uh, landscape palette, uh, but in order to do that, we have to test to make sure it's financially feasible and, and it will work in our ecosystem. We need to make sure that it, it's ecologically sound, it meets our water supply goals, uh, and is financially feasible and marketable to our buyer. Um, I'm gonna turn this over now to uh, Patrick Boland, who is actually one of the principal researchers on our on our uh, Ecolife project and uh, let Patrick uh, advance our discussions. Thank you, Richard, I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate that this opportunity to work in the outside collaborative and to try to put some of the ideas that we've developed uh, over time into action. Um, in my position as both an academic and as someone who has been in charge of managing the landscape at a major public institution at the University of Central Florida, uh, getting involved in things I didn't have a lot of experience in like landscape design and then also being left with being in charge of the maintenance. It gives me a lot of insight that others might not have. So I really want to think about what are the big driving forces that are driving 
some of the things that we're uh, seeing come down the pike. And I think a lot of what you're going to hear in my talk are, are themes that are going to, uh, you've either already heard or are going to be touched upon in the other talks as well. So I'll try to integrate that uh, from the perspective of uh, the ecological rationale of what it is we're talking about when we talk about ecology, when we talk about ecosystems. One of the big things that's really occurring now for everybody that has consequences for development in Florida, climate change is obviously a big reality. And one of the things that's really going to drive for us is temperature changes. It could change things like water and water intensity and rainfall. It could change our 100-year floodplains. Uh, and it also, for Florida, has a big consequence for sea level rise. Uh, Sunbridge isn't on the coast, but it is a coastal community. So there's a lot of uh, issues that have to be dealt with there. And some of that is, from a landscape perspective, we're going to be entering a different climate zone um, in the future, in just a couple of decades. On the bottom part of that, I show a biodiversity slide. And that little black part of that uh, diagram is basically an actual ecological index of biodiversity for the planet, a global uh, biodiversity, from 1971 to today. That's how much the global biodiversity has declined in that time period. It is another major issue that overlaps with uh, global climate change. They're really kind of inseparable. And those three scenarios that you show, the green one that I show there, the green that they show, the yellow and the gray, are kind of those different options as we look to the future. What kind of future are we going to have? And these kinds of projects we're talking about, uh, knowing that we're transforming the entire state with our development patterns, is can we push it a little bit more along those green lines? Uh, and what we're really talking about is getting these ecological services out of the developed landscape. Um, that's a concept that came out of the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment. Nature provides us with a lot of things, and it's a lot of things that people want. Um, provisioning, supporting, cultural, and, and regulating services. So we're trying to get more of that out of our built environment. Um, and water, as Richard pointed out, is really a driving factor. Uh, if you know, we're concerned about biodiversity and the ecology of systems, it's really water that drives things in Florida. Sunbridge is uh, a, a development that uh, overlaps with two water management districts in Florida. It drains into three watersheds. We know we have major water quality issues, not only in the Indian River Lagoon, shown there in the center, but also in the Kissimmee River. Uh, this development flows into both of those. Uh, the state's spent hundreds of millions of dollars to try to address some of the environmental issues there. And then on top of the water quality kind of environmental impacts, there's the consumptive use of water that, that comes into play. And that's where things like irrigation and the irrigation demand become so important and developing landscapes that rely less on that irrigation source. Um, in addition to water, you know, before we jump into biodiversity, we've got to get the water and soil right. Uh, soil uh, prep is important. Um, in the Lake Nona area, there have been some uh, site preparation work that was done that made it very difficult and created some drainage problems. Uh, the College of Medicine on the left side uh, had some of those issues and it continues to have some of those issues. So it really points to the importance of getting the soil right and the site conditions right at the beginning so that you have the best chance of uh, seeing the landscape that you want to come to life come to life. And obviously compaction and excessive disturbance that takes place. Another factor on the soil side is uh, construction soils usually are not like native soils. Florida has very nutrient poor, sandy soils, and very often the plants we might want to use in an urban environment may not work because we've changed the soils. So you really need to take that into consideration and develop your, your uh, landscape palette around what the soil conditions will be like. And it's generally altered in a developed state relative to the natural state. Biodiversity is obviously the next big issue. Um, it relates very much to what we're talking about today, and Doug Tallamy is going to get into this uh, very deeply, I think, in his talk, so I'll leave it to him there. But we do live in a biodiversity hotspot in the southeastern coastal plain. Uh, that means that not only do we have a tremendous amount of biodiversity naturally, but we also have a high development pressure. So to be a hot spot, you have to have a lot of biodiversity that's under the threat of development. Those two things have to go together. And so one of the ways you know, we try to overcome the effects of the development, obviously, through conservation, but within the built environment is really what we're talking about today. How can we develop landscapes in a way that supports things like pollinators, uh, that supports things like uh, birds and bird communities? And those two things interrelate. And the centrality of native plants is important there because the native plants provide better support for the food web. Um, the upper left picture there shows a caterpillar that's the caterpillar of the giant sulfur butterfly. It needs certain plants to eat. And if it doesn't have them, it won't grow there. And um, again, Doug Tallamy is going to get very deeply into that and talk about the importance of native plants for supporting the food web uh, because the birds need the caterpillars and the caterpillars need something to eat. So 
That very much relates to native plants. Since we talk about native plants, we do have to accept that in Central Florida, we also have kind of a horticultural paradise here in terms of the kinds of things we can grow from around the world. And I don't think, you know, from an aesthetic perspective, the field of landscape architecture developers want to throw out uh, the, all of that great horticultural splendor. So we really th think about creating kind of more intensive, showy areas in our central zones, in our, in our, in our urban area on campus. Chris is going to talk about this later in her talk, all the way out to the more marginal or even uh, entrance areas where we showcase a lot of natives. And everywhere along that spectrum, uh, we can include natives in the picture. On the left side here, we show a showy landscape that has four plants, two of which are native, two of which are introduced. And so trying to find good combinations that work is, is very important. And the other thing is the native plants, we very often don't have a good maintenance uh, uh, understanding of how to maintain these plants or how well they're going to do so. Introducing them into the environment uh, of the developed environment not only means we have to get used to a new look, uh, we might be able to have a similar look actually, but we also might have different kind of maintenance factors that we need to take into consideration. So it's not just what you plant, it's what it's going to become and what it's going to become is very much going to depend on how you manage it. So all these things kind of go together, but the main message here is that the natives should be the basic matrix of the landscape, and then you work around from there. Um, and as far as, you know, Richard did make a reference to wildlife habitat as part of their community development. It's, it's part of what they're doing. Uh, we have to take into account the green and blue infrastructure, um, and the blue infrastructure being the water, the parts of the landscape that are going to continue to provide services for us. On the left here, we're showing a 130-acre conservation easement on the University of Central Florida campus that basically 60% of our runoff from campus flows through that wetland, gets treated naturally before it enters into the Econ River. So green infrastructure is very important, and planning for green infrastructure is very important. Stormwater ponds are major uh, stormwater elements in this area, uh, in the Econ River Basin. Um, there are more stormwater ponds area than there is natural lakes, and we're in a very natural lake heavy area. So obviously we're creating a lot of these habitats, and they could really be designed and managed better for the ecology of the system. Um, here you can see some native plantings that we did in our ponds on campus. How we maintain those, we use herbicides and things like that. All of that needs to be considered, but we have a great opportunity there with stormwater ponds to create viable aquatic habitat. And then the last uh, note I want to make is that most of that biodiversity that we have in the southeast, you know, wetlands are important, are in the uplands. And if you're a developer, you know that's where you develop. You build your buildings on the uplands and you conserve the wetlands. And there's a lot of neighborhoods with conservation set-asides and it's usually the wetland that they couldn't develop. But we have to remember most of that biodiversity is in the upland. And the upland are these flatwoods ecosystems that are very open canopy systems that really to maintain their biodiversity have to be managed with fire. We've been very successful with that at UCF. So as we see that growth of development in Florida, we have to think about how are we going to balance continuing to manage these natural areas in a way that will sustain uh, the biodiversity. And so in a, these master plan communities like, like Richard has here, there's an opportunity to hit all of these targets in, to various degrees. Um, and now, you know, the next step is to think about how you take that from design to delivery, and uh, that's what Chris is going to talk about next. Cool. Thank you, Patrick. That's a perfect segue. Oops, wrong direction. Down. Yeah, so as landscape architects and design practitioners, um, it's our task to help guide the process from, from the why, the wants of, and desires of the developer, um, and then of the end user, and how do you get from that big idea to, you know, this wonderful place where, where we live and we call home? So you go through a design process. Um, we, we encourage from the very beginning that all of the key stakeholders are involved at the very beginning, um, especially on the design team side. You want an integrated design team. So, for example, um, a typical design team would include, of course, the developer. There's, there's the stakeholder. Um, or the public entity that you might be designing for. Um, civil engineer, the architect, sometimes the interior designer, surprisingly enough. Um, the, uh, the landscape architect, uh, the biologist, um, the list can, can go on, the geologist. All those folks have to understand the big picture and understand the process and be part of the process from, from the very beginning to, to really um, carry, the, carry the vision forward. At, 
my firm, Dix Height, we use a process that we call the six Ds. And it's a really great way to kind of describe, and anyone can copy this, describe to uh, stakeholders the design process. So the why is the dream. You know, we listen to that dream. We then go through the discovery process of, you know, uh, what are the soil types? What's the existing uh, ecological community? What is the overall vision for the project? Um, how is it unique and contextually relevant? Then based on all of that information, we go into the design process. At each stage, we're going back to the stakeholders to say, here's where we're at. What do you all think? Here's the direction that we're going in. So that one of those Ds is discuss, super important. So then once we get through the design phase, again, the holistic design team intact and working in tandem, um, we then go to document. Um, and that's the construction documents. Um, however, in the meantime, guess who we're also engaging? We're engaging the, um, the management team, the, which will be, will be managing the end product, um, the grower of the plant material, and the contractor. Um, hopefully, they are also on board at this stage, and they're reviewing um, the plans that we're producing. We're making sure that the plants are appropriate. We're getting their feedback. They're thinking about maintenance. So we finish the documentation, and guess what? Then we get to deliver it, and it, it goes into the field. At that point, we're handing it off to uh, somebody like David. He's going to uh, talk about that. Um, but it's really important that we go through this really um, integrated process with everybody involved. And it, honestly, it makes it a lot more fun, too. So um, over the course of the past year and a half, two years, um, we've been working on uh, how to communicate these ideas with our key stakeholders um, so that uh, it can assist in communication and it can uh, assist in the design process. Um, we talk about the landscape transect quite a bit, and we illustrate the landscape transect with graphics um, uh, such that are, are on the screen. This kind of shows uh, how an analysis might work. On the far left, it's, this is a master plan community. On the far left, you see existing um, canopy that we'd like to work around. The central slide is actually the ecological communities um, that fall within that overall community which means um, it's going to be uh, indicators for plant types that we might use in each of those areas, um, and also the soil types that we might expect. And then on, on the far right of the slide, you see, and it's, uh, it starts to get small here, but the, di the different levels of landscape intensity. So kind of going back to what Patrick said, you have areas of, of touch points and, and high levels of perhaps ornamental um, and, and mixes, but then as, as you go towards the edges and the more natural areas, um, it becomes more fully native and, and naturalized. It's just a great way to, uh, to show how these things might work. The light tan color that you see, um, those are the homesteads. And as you can see, they cover a lot of land area. So that's another nut we're trying to crack. How do you encourage um, homeowners to uh, implement uh, sustainable um, practices across their own transect. So we use graphics like this. We even talk about landscape sustainability across a transect of your homestead. And you start to break it down by, you know, the bright green is like the use area of the lawn. Um, the darker edges are, you know, framing and screening. And then as you get towards a natural edge, you might be able to go um, more, more natural. If you have existing trees, the um, uh, the eco zone underneath those existing trees uh, might be different. So it, it, gets, uh, it does get somewhat granular. Um, but it's important that this is um, looked at because it's such an important part of the big picture. So when we're dealing with more urban environments, um, we go through the same process. We share with the development team our approach to uh, levels of landscape intensity. So the, the aqua tone on, on the top might be your oasis zones. And, and this can apply on large or small scale projects, so it's a pretty useful tool. So that, that, those are your oasis zones, your entries, your, your amenity areas, that sort of thing. Then you go to a medium intensity landscape, your front door, um, the roadway edges. 
your low intensity landscape where you might be using um, you know, a few less accents but perhaps more natives uh, would be the, um, the softer green tone and then the more kind of rural um, edge and, and natural edge would be that blue tone. So same sort of idea, landscape transect, how can we, we be smart about water use and landscape intensity? So just a, a communication tool. We even use similar sorts of approaches when we're working in the public realm. Um, so this uh, graphic shows high intensity zone um, on the top, you know, where people are touching and active and playing. Again, you might use a ornamental, ornamental species like a date palm to um, provide a specific emphasis and filtered shade. But as you move away from those intense zones, you might transition to a a manicured looking, however, native landscape. Um, so that would be uh, the middle slide. In the bottom, there, as you move into more natural areas, you might have a very light imprint, perhaps very minimal landscape using the existing um, nat natural environment, perhaps just um, walking through it. The landscape um, in intensity zone graphic helps explain both the hardscape and landscape intensity across, uh, across this zone. Um, the area. You can also use this as a tool to evaluate um, price per square foot. Super useful. So then in cross-section, um, additional graphics that are helpful to show this big idea are, are, one, like, are one like the one on the screen now. Again, high intensity is in the aqua, aqua uh, tone. That's where folks are hanging out. Um, the medium intensity are those adjacencies and those edges, a pretty manicured landscape, and then the low intensity, if you think about that, that tree picture that you just saw, that might have a much lighter imprint. So similar to what, what Patrick was sharing, um, you can think about you know, taking a look at the University of Florida and doing a landscape intensity diagram over the University of Florida. It would probably look a lot like um, the, the example I showed in the first slide. So then how do you communicate? Again, I'm just wanting to share these communication tools. How do you um, share with your stakeholders what this high, medium, and low intensity uh, landscape looks like? Well, guess what? A picture tells a thousand words, as always. You know, we like to sketch, but I tell you what, you put a picture in front of a, in front of a client and they, they get it right away. So the high intensity, you know, more ornamental, um, the hardscape and landscape, higher level of uh, intensity, you might have specialty lighting, all of that. Um, that. That holds true in the landscape. It could be possibly all native, no problem, but it might be more structured. And then the medium zone gets softer again. Those are the edges that we walk by, um, transitional. And then the low intensity. It might be a natural area, like in the bottom right, or it might be a uh, a, uh, a grassy a zone um, that filters through a, a sable hammock. Um, different, um, there's different ways to deal with that. But this is a super, super useful uh, tool. So then, the fun, a uh, lot of fun, um, as we were talking and getting to know each other uh, better on this panel, uh, Richard was laughing at the landscape geeks among, amongst us. You know, we, we start getting really excited about plant material. Um, but what we do, to communicate again is we develop the palette specific to the intensity and then we share pictures of those images and we try to keep the palettes pretty tight project to project because the other thing we're starting to do and this is something that um, David and I have talked a lot about is um, document the, la the maintenance practices for each plant type. A lot of times when you use a predominantly native palette, and if you're really paying attention to spacing and placement, you don't really have to, you shouldn't have to prune and edge and, and heavy, have heavy maintenance. Uh, so it, it takes a, quite a bit of kind of thought as you're composing the design. But at the end of the day, it can mean cost savings um, uh, in the long haul, both water, um, herbicide, pesticide outputs, fertilizers, and, um, and edging. Uh, which, you know, edging and, who, who wants a, you know, edging, an edger, you know, major uh, noise as well as uh, major carbon outputs. So these are ways that we communicate um, those ideas. 
So just a few project examples. Um, I've talked about Starkey Ranch before. It continues to be a, a pretty great example of um, these practices in the public realm. Um, in our park spaces, we use predominantly native plant material. We definitely use the high, medium, and low intensity strategies. Uh, we use lawn where lawn is to be used. So like in, in a home landscape, you know, if your dog runs around the backyard or you need a place for the kids to play, you want a patch of lawn, right? Same thing in the public realm. If you're out throwing the football or throwing the frisbee, you want lawn and wonderful open play. But those edges can be, be framed by that medium um, intensity landscape that can be predominantly native. And then, you know, on the, the bottom right slide shows just a path through a natural area. And then the upper right slide shows an elevated path next to a conservation area. So using, um, using this landscape transect as we think about the master plan community um, are, are, has, uh, is becoming very successful. And, um, and Starkey is a great living example of that. Another great example is um, the work that we've been doing um, out in Hamlin in Horizons West. Uh, this particular project has all of the landscape uh, transects um, exhibited. We've been able, because of the soils out there, to implement um, low impact development practices that include uh, stormwater capture and tertiary treatment. And what that means is that rather than all the pavement just flowing into a pond directly, pipe to pit some people call it, you act, the water might flow into a swale, um, which could be planted. Um, that helps filter the water. It then might go to another swale and then eventually into, uh, into a water body. Patrick at the grand scale talked about how the conservation area you know, filters water before it goes into the econ. This is how we do this in, you know, in, in land development and, uh, and you can use natives and, um, and, uh, and beautiful, uh, beautiful applied design to, to make this happen in the built landscape. So really great examples out in, um, out in uh, West Orange County. Additionally, I mean, we even got folks like Walmart and Publix to do this, which is honestly kind of astounding, but amazing. And, and they were fully on board and it's been pretty successful. So, you know, um, Richard mentioned all of the work that's happening, um, you know, through, the, through Tavistock and, and Lake Nona and Sunbridge. Um, there's some pretty forward things, hap forward things happening that integrate these big ideas. Um, for example, eliminating a, a central roadway through a, a mixed-use district as a part of uh, an, a, a, the Orange, Can an Orange, Orange County Build Grant, grant integrating um, AV lanes and multi-purpose bike paths, but then also daylighting stormwater and um, filtering stormwater as it makes its way uh, towards, towards the water body. So these, these ideas can happen um, at, at, at pretty large scales and in areas where um, smart growth is, uh, is um, paramount. A really uh, recent example of something that's coming out of the ground is um, a, st a brand new stormwater park uh, in Oviedo, downtown Oviedo. So for those of you that might be familiar with Oviedo, they, there's an old historic downtown. And uh, we had uh, two ponds. One was a, a square uh, FDOT pond, and the other one was a rectangular <laughs> city pond. So the public works director and I, you know, chatted, gosh, it's probably been like six years ago, and he, he had this idea, and, and I shared it, that what if we combined those ponds, created a park amenity, and oh yeah, at the same time, there was a historic creek running north-south, Sweetwater Creek, that was ditched. What if we realign the creek and naturalize it, and, you know, create this, um, this, uh, this wonderful park and amenity that will probably uh, heavily influence um, positive uh, redevelopment in, um, in the old downtown. Well, sure enough, uh, the, the commission and everyone was on board. And the other thing that everyone was on board with, because we, you know, we worked with the stakeholders from the very beginning, was the idea of, well, let's make this a showcase of landscape sustainability. So everything that I'm talking about from um, you know, natural littoral edges to upland uh, uh, biodiversity to na natural buffers is happening um, at Solary Park. 
Uh, one other thing, we use Bahia sod where sod, um, sod was desired with no irrigation. So we'll be able to manage and control the irrigation as things grow in, hopefully taper, gradually taper it back. It's possible that in time this park will, will require no irrigation and very minimal outputs relative to um, uh, pesticides, herbicides, and, and fertilizers because every single plant is native. It's pretty cool. So if you're the grand opening hasn't happened yet, I'm thinking hopefully in the next month. Um, so definitely get out there if you get the chance. Crest Lake Park, another thing I mentioned, kind of looking at existing conditions and, um, and, and tree canopy. Uh, Crest Lake Park is now open in Clearwater. It's a 39 acre park. Uh, we had tremendous existing tree canopy that we worked hard to save. Um, and it was a driving factor in the overall design. That's an, an example of you know, low impact development. This park is heavily used. People want to go there. Um, we use the strategy as a part of our analysis to, um, to work through um, the design. So we talked about the homestead. Um, so much of our urban areas are um, our are, are homes. And one thing that we like to do as practitioners is test these practices um, on our own home landscapes. Um, and I've shared uh, these images in the past, but I think, I think it's really important because it, in my mind, this is a huge nut that we have to crack. Um, and, and we'll kind of uh, debate on this a little bit in, in, in a little bit. The landscape on the right is 100% native, was established with no irrigation. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, and is, is super lush. The landscape on the left is probably 80% native, um, has had irrigation for establishment, has a patch of lawn um, in the backyard for, for their puppy, um, but is very low water use. So we can apply uh, these, um, the, the, this idea of the, of the transect to our, to our own home landscapes, and we can uh, definitely minimize water and um, fertilizer outputs. So some pretty fun examples. Now I'm going to turn it over to David, and he's going to talk about how we, how we get there. So before I get into my presentation, I want to just give you a little bit of background to give kind of perspective to what I'm going to talk about. I started my uh, career at Cherry Lake and was in production and grew a lot of really beautiful trees, but very discouraged to find out there wasn't always a market for those trees and they would end up being dumped. So that wasn't exactly you know, the way you would want to see these new trees being introduced, so we'll speak to that issue. Uh, then I worked inside of the landscape construction industry where really beautiful projects would be designed, the right budget would be there, but maybe not the right contractor would end up installing them. Again, pretty big disappointment. I worked inside of the landscape uh, uh, maintenance field and also a bit disappointing to see jobs, you know, where you ended up, kind of ended up in a mow blow situation because that's what everything kind of gravitated towards at the end. And then inside of the general contractor realm, where you, know, you had projects you would be asked to build, but they weren't always put together the right way. So then you would end up in a situation again of things not being tight, turning out the way they were originally designed. So I'm gonna go through kind of some of those challenges. And now be returning to Cherry Lake, I just read Doug Talamay's book and really invigorated by the idea of putting natives back into the landscape. And how can we overcome some of these challenges that we have? So, from the general contractor world, one thing I really learned was always knowing your form of agreement. The most important thing is making sure that the form of agreement really serves the owner in the way that is intended to be served. So in my opinion, design build or design assist or negotiated or IPD are all methods as a general contractor that made me feel comfortable that the owner's you know, vision was gonna end up being executed. Along those same lines, you know, in the general contractor world, We've got to make sure that you have a pre-qualified bidders. These jobs that are put together and designed are beautiful jobs, but if you have a, a contractor who doesn't really understand the intricacies of working with a landscape architect intimately, or maybe it's a situation that they don't have the, uh, the capability to go through the bidding process, these jobs are put together in very different ways. They must have the experience, you know, they've got to work inside of these native plants before. Doing this for the first time is always a huge challenge. And builders have to have a lot of uh, pre-work before these jobs are put onto the, into the bidding world. 
And then the design team. You know, one of the, the really important things is whoever, like you had spoke about earlier, whoever goes to design these projects needs to be involved in the construction side. As a general contractor, one of the challenges would be that, you know, the construction administration wasn't always in our contract. So we would go to get help from a landscape contractor where that had been removed somewhere. So then there wasn't the, the link between the general contractor and the, and the, um, the builder. You must have the availability to, to maintain and warranty what you've maintained, right? Because we're going to put these projects together, and whoever really installs it, in my opinion, all should have the ability to maintain it. And when we go to maintain it, we really need to give whoever we're maintaining it a five-year budget. You know, one of my passions in life is you think about it when you buy a new car, you're given a maintenance, you're given a, a manual, and you figure out a maintenance budget if you want that car to live. But when we have landscapes, you know, many times there isn't the the, the maintenance budget, there isn't the manual, so that we're kind of just left to our own devices to go out there and you know, kind of figure this stuff out. And what ends up happening is we kind of go to the lowest uh, point. And then again, knowing that form of agreement is highly important uh, in the sense of that we got to make sure that the, uh, all the stakeholders are being served, right? The general contractor is being served, the owner is being served. So again, I go back to making sure we have the, the right form of agreement. Another issue that we seem to have in the uh, landscape contractor world is understanding the maintenance standards, right? <clears throat> Something you spoke to. You know, uh, plants that are really well-performing plants, let's say a, a Kakunti palm is, is a great plant, but if we don't have the right maintenance standards, people end up hedging it like, a, like any other hedge. And then it becomes kind of a nuisance plant. But if we had a maintenance standard that says, hey, cut these to the ground every spring, let them come back, now all of a sudden we took a plant that serve so many great functions and then really can deliver what it needs to deliver because of that maintenance standard. But without those maintenance standards, what will end up happening is we'll just end up with a great potential plan but never really follow through. And again, on that budgeting side, you know, owners, when they put these projects together, if you're spending, you know, millions of dollars on these landscapes, they really have to understand what is the investment strategy, what shrubs need to be replaced at what times, where do I need to reinvest, what arbor care do I need? Otherwise, you, again, can end up in a situation where the owner doesn't have the financial uh, budget in place for the maintenance, uh, for the landscape that's been designed. And with native plants, I think that uh, it's just another layer of complexity because a lot of landscape contractors haven't worked with those plants before. So now they've got a new set of plant palette they have to maintain. They don't have the, necessarily the protocol, and then the budget might not be in line. So I think if we kind of unpack those you know, challenges, I think that we can be successful in native plants. But I think we, you know, have got to work just a little differently than we've worked in the past. Cool. All right. I don't, I don't think I need this. So, um, so you all have now heard kind of the, the thoughts across the spectrum from, you know, the ideation, the dream, Richard, um, through uh, delivery, David. Um, one thing that we talked about a lot as we were uh, preparing for this discussion was um, kind of how might we actually change the paradigm? What might be uh, the, some of the tools that we can use to kind of shift how people think about the landscape and, um, and, and, so, and, and make it such that um, at the market level, the home buyer um, or folks that might be modifying their landscapes, um, you know, to, to take this mantle and, and carry it. Um, and a few of us had some pretty interesting ideas, and I don't know if, if any of you all might want to address that, maybe Richard. Well, from a master plan community uh, developer standpoint, um, the public realm makes up a certain percentage of the project, the vast majority of the land, and the landscape is in the private, is in the private home. And so for us um, to shift the paradigm from conventional landscape design to sustainable landscape design. We're doing what we, what I talked about. We have to figure out it can, does it work financially and what works in our ecosystem. If we can get through this experiment and determine that we have a viable, sustainable approach to landscape, um, we can then move from just doing it in the public realm to encouraging it uh, on the private home side. So for instance, um, we're looking at um, sustainable landscape packages in our first model homes to be able to show the potential buyer what it looks like side by side to, towards a conventional um, landscape design. I don't know what those two are gonna look like. It's a little bit of a risk here. We don't know what they're gonna look like, but it is a little bit exciting to be able to put both of those in front of the, the buyer 
and let the buyer choose. And on the one hand, you can say this is, doesn't use pesticides, herbicides, or, or certainly significantly reduced. Your water bills will go down. You know, all the right messaging against, uh, you know, uh, juxtaposed against a, a conventional design. I'm excited about that. It is all about education and, and shifting the mindset of the home buyer and the homeowner away from what's typically been done in the past to what can be done for the future. That's interesting. Um, it's, you know, as, a, as a, a designer, sometimes I wonder, I wonder if in your experiment, um, if you just launched with just a, a, a really nicely designed native model and uh, just kind of see how it ran. That just comes to my mind. <laughs> don't give them, don't do, give them the option. <laughs> I do think uh, you know, the market uh, it does drive it. Um, you know, you can't buy a lot of native material at the nurseries because it's not being produced, and yeah. it's not being produced because the demand's not there. So I think the big buyers, the big developers, have the chance to push the market the most because yeah. they're the big buyer. Yeah. And then we, there's a disjunct there, then you have to get from the big buyer, if we can make that work, down to the small buyer. So you could go to Home Depot and, get, and pick up yeah. a fire bush or, you know, whatever it's going to be. So I think there's that part. And then we've talked about this too, and I talked about this with Dave, and I know we talked about it previously. You know, people are going to, you can have a native landscape that's very messy and very kind of wild looking, but there's also ways you can use native plant material that it looks just like a regular landscape in terms of its structure and form. It just has different material that's providing a different service that has more pollinators, whatever it is. Um, and, and I think you, you've been in the industry, so David, you know what that is and you have that look you want because you've been doing maintenance and growing. And so you, giving uh, a spectrum of options to people who might want to take it in different directions is good too. Mm -hmm. But um, we want, because we want to offer all of those things, but you want to offer something that people are going to buy. And, and, and people do have, there's very powerful social norms for what that is. Yes. And so uh, that's, a, I think, a stepwise process to get there is to make it acceptable and palatable to the customer. Yeah, um, make it make it a make it a want. I, I want that landscape yes, because that is it, that's what I should be doing. And we got to remember that you know we do have a lot of native plants that are already produced in the in the land, in the nursery environment, right? We have Walters, we have Burnham, we have Anis, we have Schillings, Holly. So there's a lot of plants that we have available for us to create those landscapes. And then I think there's a lot of other plants that are near that point where just a little bit of push where someone would say, Hey, I'm committed to this plant, and that goes back to my experience of producing these great plants, but then having to dump them because the market wasn't there. If we could just make a little bit more of a turn to some additional native plants, I think we could make that jump and then have more you know, plants available for you guys to design around. So that's yeah, which would be really great. I do get the sense that there's hearing from designers and others. Well, there's some big projects we've done. Lake Nona, College of Medicine, was a very native uh, landscape. Some people didn't like it. It was too green or it was too different. Uh, and and uh, Chris, you did, I met you, in fact, when you worked on one at uh, UCF, a very successful landscape, about 90%. 90% native at the mm -hmm. Neptune housing. So we've had some really successful native projects. It's, it's just a question of getting it kind of accepted and, and applied more broadly. Right, right. Yeah, I wonder, uh, the, the other thing we talked about a lot was um, kind of the regulatory frameworks that, um, you know, either jurisdictionally uh, may be coming into play or, um, as Richard mentioned, might be established as a part of an overall master plan community. Do y'all have any, any thoughts on, on that, on, on kind of the push towards the refinement of regulatory frameworks that support these ideas? Well, just from a developer standpoint, it's all about water supply. And um, we know that the runway for cheap and available water is, is short. Yeah. And so we feel like we don't have a choice, um, that we have to move in this direction to conserve water supply. Um, so that's the macro regulatory environment then how do you how do you apply what regulations if any do you apply to you know the the homestead or the individual property uh, that's the challenge is is it compulsory or is it do you do it through education yeah. and I think of both we talked about doing both of those things because the HOA code is important to the homeowner they have to live by it and if it's if it's combined with the reason why we do it and what the, the educational part I think that and we really need success, but HOAs have a big impact, and uh, people do have requirements and codes they have to live by. Yeah, one thing I think about when you um, when you start to to speak about maintenance is the you know the, the landscape maintenance in, industry, David, and the education um, in in that you know for for those professionals, 
Do you have any thoughts there on, on kind of steps that could be taken? I think that, you know, through the, the bid process is part of the, where the problem happens, is that, you know, jobs get bid lower and lower, and then you end up with nothing left but Moblo and Go, yeah. kind of budget less. So I think that if, you know, we started by having a good maintenance protocol that said this is what needs to be done, then bids, jobs would come in bid correctly and then maintain correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, being on some HOA uh, committees when doing landscape maintenance, I was kind of surprised by a lot of members being more educated than we give them credit for. People knowing the importance of water usage, people knowing the importance of natives, knowing the fact that you know we really should be using pine straw versus you know pine nugget mulch. So I think that the homeowner might not be as behind as we think they are sometimes. I think just with a little bit more push, a little more education, a little more why are we doing this, I think we could get some really good results. So probably are much closer than we think, I hope, to you know achieving that uh, homeowner who really respects and understands the need for a you change. Know, I, I chair a number of community development district boards and I have to agree with David exactly. There's pressure to keep costs down and you, you sacrifice quality. So um, the establishment of high, high maintenance standards, high quality maintenance standards up front, I think will go a long way to moving us in, in the right direction. Yeah. I know that I think we only have a, a minute or so left. Um, any closing thoughts? Is there is there hope, you know, uh, to uh, to change the paradigm? And are, are you are you all seeing a shift? Are you is the market um, going to uh, going to bear it? I think it's an exciting time. The fact that we're here and having some of these partnerships, um, and that there seems to be a lot of interest generated from both sides of it. I think you know I'm, I'm pretty hopeful. I really think we're in a position where we, we have to do this because you know there's only so much water supply that we've all talked about. So I don't think there's a lot of options left. If we you know if we're gonna you know, have a landscape that we can maintain to any degree, it's gonna have to be a landscape that's different than it's out there. There just really isn't enough water left to continue to maintain uh, continue to plant landscapes that we have for the past 20 years. So I think we're kind of like you say at the end of the runway. De definitely awesome. Richard, anything to add? I just think the, the, the experiment, the design we're doing, which brings the private developer together with academia, with the private sector, I mean, these, we all have to work together to solve this problem. And I'm excited about this applied research. And we will get answers that are unique to our project. And, um, and we will apply them uh, going forward. So uh, I do think there's hope. That's awesome. So we'll end it on, on hope. And, uh, and we'll all continue to work hard. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude towards this year's Outside CoLab sponsors. Today and tomorrow's events could not be possible without their generous support and inspirational leadership. We are deeply grateful for their contributions to this collaborative, and we encourage all of our audience members to learn more about these organizations on OutsideCollab.com.